Welcome to episode 5 of the Harsh Review, where we talk about movies, TV, and all things entertainment. My name is Sean, and with me is my brother Ryan. Welcome, everyone. How's your week been treating you? Oh, pretty good. How about you? It has been a little bit rainy, a little bit cloudy, and not a whole lot going on. Well, sounds exciting. Yep, I'm excited for this episode. We'll be talking about Star Wars The Last Jedi, but before we get there, what have you been watching, Ryan? Well, uh, have you heard of a guy named Alec Guinness? Uh, Didn't he invent the beer? Yes, that guy. Yes, I owe him a lot of respect. Yes. No, you've never heard of Alec Guinness. Oh, come on, yes I have. Who is he? Luke. <laughs> yes. Luke. Alec Guinness played Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan? In the, uh, original, the original Star Wars. So I watched a movie. The uh, Phantom Menace? To... Yes. No. <laughs> New Hope? Oh, okay. New Hope. Yes. Going back? Okay. Can I continue? Yes. Okay. Uh, anyway, he was in a movie in 1962 called Bridge on the River Kwai, which is considered a classic of American cinema, and he actually won an Oscar for it, Best Supporting uh, Actor, I believe. Wow, I haven't seen this one yet. I know of it. Yeah. I've seen it around. I just actually haven't sat down and watched it. Pretty good. I'm about halfway through it. It's uh, directed by the guy who did Lawrence of Olivier, so it's got the kind of law. Long- Big sweeping camera angles and landscapes and everything. Old school Hollywood. Yeah, totally old school Hollywood. Got the music, you know, rises up when something happens. And uh, it's pretty exciting. What's the the whole premise? It centers on a uh, prisoner war camp in, I believe it's Burma. And the Japanese have captured Americans and British. And they want them to build this bridge as part of the war effort for the Japanese. Mm-hmm. And Al- Alec Guinness plays this British commander who's more or less sticking to his guns. He's making concessions with the Japanese commanding officer, trying to see if he can get the best for his men because he's very well respected in the prison camp. And then on a separate kind of side story, one of the Americans has escaped from the camp and he uh, eventually leads this kind of attack onto the bridge because they're going to plan to blow the bridge up. So I'm about right there where they're coming up into the camp and Alec Guinness's people are building this bridge that they may or may not finish. Is he leading the uh, rogue troops? Alec Guinness, no. He's he's leading the effort to build the bridge. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. So so I'm thinking there's going to be, just kind of predicting what's going to happen next, I'm thinking there might be some kind of conflict between his character and the American character played by William Holden. So we'll see what happens. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let me know what you think of it. Um, I might add it to my list. That is one of those classics that you got to watch. So if if it's uh, not a lot going on and I want to watch a bridge blow up, I know where to go. Exactly. Is it on Netflix? Is it on, where are you seeing it? I'm uh, renting it. Oh, so you, you, you ponied up. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let me know what you think. I will. Have you ever uh, seen Bright on Netflix? I, I have it, but it's on my list. And, and you know what? It kind of reminds me of a movie called Alien Nation. Um, you, oh, yeah. Isn't that the that Janet movie? Jackson song? Yeah, that movie. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, song. It, it sounds really familiar. Remind me. Alien Nation was, it's in the, I think it was the late 80s. And the, the gist is that aliens have invaded Earth and they're cohabiting with humans. So they're taking jobs and working with humans. And James Kahn, who you may know from Misery and The Godfather, he plays yeah, a cop. Yeah. And then he has to team up with this other guy played by the sword fighter from Princess Bride. Okay. He's, okay. On, he's on Homeland. Uh, and That guy's playing an alien. So seeing the, the preview for Bright kind of reminded me of that premise. Wait, hold, Just, on, hold on a second. You talk, the guy, yeah. the... Amigo Montoya? Yeah, that's That's the, guy. the dude on Homeland? Yeah. Uh, I, just, I totally just made that <laughs> connection right now. Uh, crazy, huh? Yeah. Wow, his head exploded. Yeah, a little bit. I, I think alcohol, not... <laughs> alcohol might do that to you. <laughs> yeah, I heard that dude is a real prick to work with. Uh, he looks like a prick. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, no. So, yeah, that's about it. I, I think I remember seeing the movie. Uh, there was a show, TV show that didn't last too long, but... 
that kind of premise just reminds me of the premise for Bright, except I'm assuming Bright is dealing with yeah. like orcs and fairies and yeah. whatnot. So, so what do you think? So let me let me get you caught up a little bit. So Will Smith and Joel Egerton are the main characters in this, and you can kind of say that Will Smith is a cop. Somehow he kind of is coming back off of a leave. I think there was an injury where he got jumped and shot and his partner didn't have his back. So it st- kind of starts with him setting up his characters, going back to work, and, and quickly introduces you to his partner, who is an orc, and that's played an by orc. Joel. And, and the orcs are basically the lowest of the low in their little society that they have. Ah, so yeah, you, so- do, you do have elves as well, which are kind of the richer class the elite so to speak humans are in there amongst all the other uh, races that are in the melting pot of la what about what about gnomes um i don't remember gnomes i know there's fairies are they are they digging for diamonds or what's no and it doesn't go that far um uh, and really uh, i mean it was entertaining i didn't think it was that great i think it had a lot of potential it was done well for for whatever their budget was. Very action, very violent, a lot of gunfights. But essentially, the premise is, is that there's a couple of these magic wands that some folks own, and they're super powerful. So they did. A I'm great, tapping out. They did a great job of. Uh, you said magic wand. I'm tapping out. Yeah, yeah, magic wand. Uh huh. Think of it as like a futuristic vibrator that everybody wants. And, okay. And uh, so. The, the wand has all these powers and if you are not a bright and you ho- and you hold the wand you'll explode or you'll instantly just die so nice. only certain people actually have the ability to hold it and survive yeah but if you have the wand all your powers and dreams can come true and they're very rare and somehow one goes missing and it comes into their possession so it's kind of like training day or it's kind of like those movies where uh, the main characters are kind of separated from everybody else and they're just trying to survive while everybody's hunting after them because they know that, w- that they're in possession of a magic wand. Uh, Same director of Training Day, I believe. Yeah, that's where you get yeah. the, uh, that's where you kind of get that flavor from. So there's a lot of great things going does, on. Does, about uh, the, does, the or- does the orc make Will Smith uh, smoke PCP or? No, nothing that heavy, does unfortunately. He that would have made it a little bit different. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> But unlike brighter, unlike training brighter. day, yeah, they stay kind of the straight and narrow. Uh, okay. But everybody is a little bit corrupt. Everyone gets a taste for the power because they see that this magic wands is in their grasp, and people don't really understand. They think that they're the one. So lots of people grabbing it and dying. And overall, though, I think there's some huge holes in it that uh, were what I would consider missed opportunities. And that was you couldn't come up with something better than a magic wand. Well, they actually did it pretty good, though. So okay. that was one of the only things in there that was that I thought was pretty cool. They had elements of the characters, and they kind of you think it's going to be about some racial kind of thing that shows, you know, why orcs are where they're at and how the whole thing develops. But ultimately, it, it just kind of was very simple with this plot and premise. Uh, it was executed well. It was very creative. A lot of potential, sure. but just the lack of backstory, uh, the lack of getting me to care and understand all the details of this world, I think we're missing. Uh, and that's a standalone movie? Is that gonna- They're going to make a sequel. They're, uh, they're both coming back. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is I believe it was the highest watched Netflix show within the period of time that it was released. So a lot of people wow. saw it. A lot of people we have mixed feelings on it. You'll go and look at reviews and it's kind of lukewarm. It's a good B minus flick. Uh, it, a lot of potential. Will a big so. draw. He, he did great. Yeah. He, he played straight up Will Smith. Um, and Joel was also, he did great with a lot of the costumes and things that they had. And so mainly you the core of the movie is those two playing off each other. Cause they don't really like each other. It's got a very lethal weapon vibe to where this is my partner. I don't like this guy. And then one guy's crazy. The other guy's not. So there's a lot of Riggs el- and Murtaugh. Yeah. Riggs and Murtaugh. There's a lot of elements going on with it. Uh, it's not going to hit with everybody. Uh, but if you like action, you want to kind of see it. There's a lot of, go- there's a lot that has going on. So check it out. Bright on Netflix. You might check it, it out if you like magic wands. Magic wands. Yeah, you're really hung up on those wands. <laughs> I, I, I'm not buying it, but I'll check it out. Okay, who does magic wands right? Name a movie where magic wands are totally badass. The Illusionist. <laughs> There's no wands in there, is there? 
in the director's cut, I think. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. But one of the one of the deleted scenes, I think he has a, a magic, magic wand. wand. Yes. Well. Moving on. Anyway, Star Wars. <laughs> Star Wars. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do a big deep dive into Star Wars, but first, uh, let me just kind of set up a little bit. This is gonna be a total deep discussion. We don't really care about spoilers. If you haven't seen the movie yet, now's a good time to kind of hit pause, move on, come back after you've seen the movie. Hopefully you enjoy our discussion about it. And we're going to kind of go over the whole thing. We're going to talk about the plot, talk about the characters, talk about our feelings about Star Wars, a little bit of everything. So let's go talking about Star Wars, The Last Jedi. Rey develops her newly discovered abilities with the guidance of Luke Skywalker, who is unsettled by the strength of her powers. Meanwhile, the Resistance prepares for battle with the First Order. Essentially, the movie starts off with the First Order plotting to seize military control of the galaxy, and a team of Resistance fighters led by General Leia Organa are planning an evacuation from their main base as Supreme Leader Snoke. His forces are coming for them. The Resistance hold out hope that Luke Skywalker will return to bring hope. The Last Jedi. This movie is crushing it at the box office. It's over one point two billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Didn't uh, it do like fifty million the first night or something? Oh, I have. I I don't know the exact numbers, but it's killing it. It's already, I believe, in the top ten all time, and it's only been out somewhere what, about four or five nice. weeks right now. It's nice to see that something that essentially came out the year I was born is still killing it at the box office and it's transcended the movies and it's carried over to this new generation. There's a lot of equity. If you put the word star Wars at the beginning of your, your film, uh, and the last Jedi did not disappoint. Um, before we dive into details, I'm just going to say that my overall impressions of it is I enjoyed the movie a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things that was unsurprising. Yeah. Uh, or I'm sorry, surprising. I didn't, I didn't actually anticipate. I was on my edge a lot, kind of not knowing where they're going to take it. Uh, there's a lot of head scratchers as well, things that are kind of unsettling that you didn't quite expect. And essentially, the director, Ryan Johnson, expands what we know of as the Star Wars universe. It's one of those movies where you don't have to see it a second time, but if you do, once you kind of get over the expectations part, you kind of start to really appreciate it for what it is and it starts to sink in a little bit more. Maybe you'll be a little less critical. Maybe you'll like it more or less. Uh, but I found that it definitely helped me kind of really identify how I felt about it being a star Wars fan and heading in with certain expectations and leaving with something completely different. Ryan, what what are your thoughts? What did you think? Well, I, I did see it twice and I, I enjoyed it as well. There were a couple things I had issues with, little minor things, really just kind of one thing, but overall it was good. <laughs> I, you could you could tell it was, it's really a Disney movie. Oh, you think you so? Get down to, when you get, well, is it is it an owned by Disney or? Yeah, yeah, it is a Disney movie. No, no mistake in mean, there. There's some, there's some Disney-ish stuff in there. It's not too overpowering though. It really sticks to the Star Wars premise. Mm-hmm. I, I I enjoyed it. I really liked it. I mean, the the CGI was great. I thought the acting was good uh, for Mark Hamill, especially. Mm-hmm. It was nice nice to see him connect with some of the older characters that I remember. I, I'm I'm really into the first two Star Wars movies. I guess you could say in the series four and five. So I'm really into Star Wars and Empire, and it's kind of nice to see a lot of those older characters, except for uh, Han Solo, of course, get together and hash it out again sure sure along with the newer characters so it kind of melds the past and the uh, present and the future together into one movie it was satisfying and and one thing i want to point out is and this is how i felt about the prequels even the originals going back to kind of what george lucas said is that this is a movie for 12 year old boys you know or 12 year old kids uh, he's making a kid's movie. This isn't a movie that's targeted for us per se. And so even with the prequels and things, I always kind of keep that in mind. 
Uh, so criticism, I think, can only go so far. Uh, yeah. Because it's not necessarily targeted for me, but there's a lot that you can kind of extract from it. Very similar to like maybe a Pixar movie where there's a lot in there for the kids, but there's enough clever humor and clever references that the adults can also find it entertaining. Now, not well, I, I love it when people attack like the dialogue. The, the dialogue wasn't good. It wasn't realistic. Well, it's not a dialogue. Go back and look at the, yeah. the New Hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go back and rewatch that, the dialogue is horrible. It, well, and it, it wasn't that great. When and, and has so it been great? In yeah, any Star I mean, Wars movie, period. I I know, but some people are going to go in there and go, well, the the dialogue was kind of cheesy and it sucked, but it's like it's not Shakespeare. It's not going to it's not that kind of movie. It's it's a visual feast. It's story driven. It's based in mythology. We're not we're not aiming for for high marks on the dialogue. And I, and I think the dialogue is pretty sufficient, you know. So let let's walk through this a little bit, and we'll kind of hi- okay. highlight some of the areas where where maybe we bumped our head a little bit of how we thought. So essentially, when the movie starts, you have to get the whole crawl, which was something that people weren't sure if Ryan Johnson was going to do. There's this really kick-ass opening space battle. Poe's out there making, shaking and bacon, making things happen. And visually, it is probably one of the better space sequences that you've seen out of all the Star Wars movies. Um, Even though they all kind of start the same, this one was, was nice. Yeah, they all kind of start I mean, the same, but most of them don't really lead into this type of scenario, so to speak. The right. Force Awakens quickly introduced some of the ships and went down to the planet. Uh, you go back to the couple of the other ones. So there, there was still a unique flavor to the opening space battle, which I enjoyed. I thought it was pretty awesome. There's a lot of cool visuals. Right away, you get two things that hit me right away. Is that A, different director. This is not J.J. Abrams. And B, with the opening dialogue uh, humor between Poe and, and, and Hux, you instantly realize like, okay, this is going to be a different movie. So, and I like that. That was kind of, that was kind of funny. You enjoyed it. I, I did. I, I think, I think Oscar Isaac's great. So I think he's great for that role. Um, yeah, he did really good with that. That was funny. Yeah. And I, I couldn't recognize the guy he was, I mean, I'm just now putting it together. The guy he's talking to is the guy he was starring with in Ex Machina, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I can't even, I couldn't even recognize, uh, what's his name? Gleason. Yep. Nominal Gleason. I, yeah, I couldn't even recognize him in, in the Star Wars movie as being that same guy. He looks kind of different in everything I've seen him in. Yeah, he's a little bit more pink. Uh, you know, looks like he yeah, hasn't I mean, gotten a whole pasty. lot of sun. <laughs> well, he's Irish, I believe. So uh, okay, well. he, he's got that look going, kind of going for him. But yeah, it's the there is that interesting relationship. But a, a lot of people right away, that was a very strong statement, I think, to make this early with the like kind of oh, I'm on hold joke. You know, I appreciate it. I liked that what they're trying to do. I thought it maybe it was just a little too long, but I mean, that's, I mean, come on, how critical can you really be um, again over the dialogue and what they're trying to do? Um, Pose a smart ass and that really shows what kind of person he is. Yeah. And he was the same kind of way in, in the original force awakens, you know, who talks first? Do I talk first? You talk first. He's got his yeah. whole little routine. So that kind of comes along. You know, and after the 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 space battle, dropping the bombs, they what they believe is they achieve success is you're going to Finn waking up from his coma. That was his introduction to this movie after getting spliced open by Kylo in the last movie. And that was a little campy with the way that he woke up. And so you instantly start getting some of that yeah. old school Star Wars humor that's in there, but maybe it's a little bit more forward than it's for it's for twelve year olds. Yes, yes. So. Again, I I didn't really have an issue with it, but it's a lot more than what was previous, or at least the pacing of it compared to the previous movie. It's just like, all right, let's move on to the next joke. Yeah, it, and it didn't it didn't have that type of slapstickness to it, but some some folks saying it's a little too space balls with some of that humor. <laughs> uh, but but overall, that would have been funny. But overall, at least they were consistent with it. it. And if they only had a couple of those moments, and then they toned out for another hour and a half, it would have felt strange. Yes. So, yep, Finn's up his coma. Characters are kind of back. The band's getting back together. And then we go over to Ray, who is on Octo with Luke. And what were your thoughts when she hands him the lightsaber and Luke just tosses it over his shoulder? That that was kind of another funny, semi-funny scene. Yeah. And it, it, it signals a change with that character. Because you're used to seeing Mark Hamill, especially in the first two Star Wars. He's just whines. All the time. Yeah, yeah, and, he is a and, complainer. 
And and that role's been taken over by Kylo Ren, who is the person I had an issue with because he, now he's the whiny bitch. But the the fact that Luke took the, the lightsaber, threw it off the cliff, it just shows that he's changed in, in who he is. I mean, of course, we haven't seen him in a long time, but this is now kind of who he is. Maybe a little more cynical or realistic. We're not really sure yet. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. It was definitely not what I was expecting. So again, okay. you're going to have those kind of moments. And that's what I appreciate about the movie is that most Star Wars where, I mean, you keep in mind, we're coming off of Force Awakens, which is essentially New Hope blueprint. It follows yes. that same pacing, stayed very safe, kind of gave us exactly what we wanted to, you know, after we come on off of the, uh, uh, the prequels and the disappointment that came with those. So I think uh. The Force Awakens did what it needed to do. But very early on in this movie, once you see Luke, everybody's expecting, like, what's going to happen? We've been waiting a year. What's going to happen? And he just kind of goes like, nope, which some folks are that's saying it. that's that's Ryan Johnson's biggest, you know, fuck you to J.J. Abrams. Um, Ouch. And there are some of those moments to where you, it really could have gone many different directions. And clearly he has his own vision here. We'll get back to to how, well, how I feel about that. It sets up the conflict. It sets up the conflict early because if he would have just said, "Yeah, come on in, let's start your training tomorrow," it would have been a different movie. But the the fact that he's resistant to training this person it makes it a lot different. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, reminded me a lot of what it was like when Luke met Yoda. <clears throat> yes. Very, very similar. That now you're you're kind of being an oddball and you're kind of not being the person that. You know, this is Luke Skywalker, so Ray's all jazzed up, finally meets the guy, and it's not what she's expecting. He's an asshole. He's an yeah, he's an asshole. He lives by himself on this uh, uh on this island with a bunch of little frog maids helping out. Seems like a boring existence. It does. Like uh, he catches a fish with a big pole at one point, but that Yeah, you even even Ray says you don't look too busy during the day, which I thought was kind of funny too. I I liked it. I I thought that they're yeah. they're playing around with his character a little bit, not taking themselves too serious. And also, imagine if you don't have you don't know who Luke Skywalker is. These are the only movies you've seen. You've only seen Force Force Awakens and Last Jedi. You're that twelve year old kid. So look at it from that point of view you don't really have these expectations of what Luke is or is not supposed to be. This is your first impressions of him. So that's right. how I'm, that's how I'm approaching it. I'm not going to it as the fanboy that has all these things built over the year. What I think Luke is going to do. I don't think that's fair. The movie wasn't, wasn't made for me. And, uh, it, it, I think it, it kind of misses the whole point of the story that they want to tell. So now, since we're talking about, we're talking about, sorry, we're talking about Luke really quick. What was this issue that Mark Hamill had with the movie and the portrayal of Luke? Sure. So comment on that. Yeah. Th there's been a lot of different discussion where initially he was not on board with Ryan Johnson's vision of where he thought Luke should be. He didn't think that Luke would have isolated himself. He thought that Luke ah. would stayed in the fight and would have been the leader that everybody needs. Um, but ultimately, I mean, you got to be mindful that, Ryan Johnson inherited the story from the force awakens. He didn't put him on the Island. That was something that True. he had to work through with JJ's going, this is where, this is where Luke is at. So everybody needs to find him. Off. So yeah. So once you kind of get handed that, he's like, okay, this is the circumstance I'm in. Here's where I'm going to take it. So there has been a lot of that directed at Ryan Johnson, which personally I don't as much. He could have taken it in many different ways, but how would you explain it better? What would really be something that you think would ap appease everybody of why Luke is there and what is he supposed to do or how is he supposed to, to act now that some, some girl shows up, hands him his lightsaber and goes, Hey, we need you. And you know, so I kind of felt like it was appropriate. I was on board and going along with it. And I kind of liked, like you mentioned, dude's an asshole. He's the one to be left alone. Keep me out of it. And it's just an old codger. He's you know? an old he codger. Just, get off my lawn or get off my island. Right. Gran Torino uh, Skywalker. And so, yes, you mentioned that uh, uh, he's out fishing. You kind of see what he does on his day to day. And that includes uh, milk and sea cows for, for, for a little snack. That was pretty disgusting. <laughs> what did you? A lot of people were hung up on that scene. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny. Um 
I don't know. It kind of fit with what ah. they were trying to establish. I mean, I've mentioned this before in the past podcast. I like seeing the way of life. It's nice to kind of see where you're getting things. Like, yeah, you live on an island. There's not many resources. This is what you, you do. Know, so, somebody somewhere is cooking up, making that some marketing ploy and coming up with like a Skywalker milkshake uh, based on the on the stuff you drink. I'm sure the somebody blue milk, out the green milk, thinking of something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a big it's a big marketing thing. Someone's going to come up with sure. something to watch. I I thought it was funny. It was, it was kind of cute for what it was, and, and the reaction and the and the way that it was done was was pretty funny. So uh, when you saw it in the theater, were people like, "Uh," uh I think everyone was really confused. I saw opening night. And uh-huh. you could kind of tell people weren't really known what to make of it. But afterwards, that's probably one of the very first things people talked about was like, what was up with the nipple scene? So, yeah. I don't know. Anyways, after they're spending some time on the island, we start to get introduced to, to Luke and Ray. And the plot starts moving along. She's trying to convince him to give her knowledge, train her, help her, fight the resistance. Luke is saying no, not having any of that. And we're quickly back out into the ship where Leah is having her confrontation with Poe. Pissed off at Poe because a lot of people died in his heroic efforts to uh, attack the, the the First Order that we saw in the opening space battle. So he gets demoted. And Poe reminds me of Maverick a little bit. Yeah, a little little bit of Maverick. A little, little bit. I see a little bit. of It's kind of a cross between Maverick and Han Solo. He's dangerous. That's why. He's dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. And um, yeah, so Maverick... <laughs> Gets demoted by Poe, or Poe gets demoted by Leah, and uh, not Maverick. And <laughs> I messed you up there. Ky- Kylo's coming around. Goose. G- Goose. Uh, Kylo's coming around, and he's going to be attacking this ship. Knows that his mama is inside, has a hesitation. His squads come around and blow Leah right out to space. So, first impressions Leah's out in space. What do you think? That was it? Do you think they wrote her off? Uh, yeah, but how, I mean, how she got back on the ship was kind of... What, Mary Poppins it? Yeah. Well, so what are your thoughts uh, on her using the Force or showing those kinds of powers? I mean, it was kind of cool, but it, it just looked kind of cheesy. Yeah, I, I, I think it's cool a, that a they... Little, a little bit. They, she would have blown up. You you would have thought, and... yeah. You know, so for me, I'm not hung up on her demonstrating something of her powers. We knew that she's had them. That was mentioned in the uh, Return of the Jedi, that right. those things are in her. It's nice that they got to kind of introduce that element there. Um, but what was it was just how they did it. The scenario is not too bad. I just think the way that it was executed, the way that it looked, it could have been a lot better. That was kind of hacky. It was a little hacky. Uh, so. I was okay with what they're trying to accomplish. It just felt weird. Actually, the weirdest part to me wasn't her just floating back in there. Is the door opens and she walks on in, and I'm kind of thinking like, wait a second, isn't that a huge vacuum now because it's been blown to bits? Like, how does she how does she open the door and all these people are standing there and she rolls in? Uh, and we learned that in, we learned that in Aliens. Yeah, about the we've seen that happen plenty of times. Right, 2001. All, it's not doesn't work that way. And at the same time, uh, Akbar's dead. So yeah, that bummed me out, man. He could have had something a little bit better. Cause I had that toy. I had this special order when I was a kid. The Akbar toy. Yeah, I, I had a, like you got a little coupon. You had to you had to wait for it in the mail for like six weeks, and I had the toy, and it really bummed me out when he died. Well, you had a little connection with Akbar. I didn't know that. He's ugly, ugly as hell. But you know, sure. Well, he looks like a like a big Bubba Gump shrimp looking dude. Right, um, big frog. Big frog. Yeah. Uh, personally, I didn't really care. I think that he hasn't gotten a lot of screen time. He said a couple funny lines that people mocked over the years. Re- what do you think about the guy? Back up a minute. Like the first five minutes, the guy that just like blew up in his cockpit really quick. <laughs> I I don't I don't remember which one you're talking about. I kind of picked that up on the second one, but I'm sorry. Anyway, that was kind of he looked familiar. He looked like he was in another Star Wars. He he may have been a carryover from the previous. Uh, okay. I should know that I'm drawing a blank on that guy, but were you getting at that? Uh, it was a bit odd that they just did that. Well, just like they just kind of kill these people and then just kind of move on. Move it, on. Usually, yeah. it seems like, yeah, you know, you think they. It's just never. It's not like it's really super violent because the other Star Wars had never been like that. It was just kind of treated a little differently. It seemed. It's all implied death. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah. So, 
so Leah's now in what we would say is like a coma. She's getting recovered. And so we kind of, did she come back in through the airlock? That's what I, that's what I'm saying. She, she seemed okay to me. Well, she, she made it that far. Then, you know, I'm hurt. Get her, get her taken care of. Yeah. It was I'm just, a, it. it was just a strange sequence. I, I, like I mentioned, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I liked what they were going for. I just felt like it was a little bit loose in the execution. Could, or it was forced. Yeah. A little forced. Move on. Uh, so now we're getting to space Skype or the, the forced force time with uh ah. ray and kylo where they start kind of identifying this connection and talking to each other which i thought was a pretty clever way to to bridge that distance between the two of them uh what did you think as that as being a plot device to connect those two it was all right i, I didn't like seeing him with his shirt off at one point he's pretty hot man what are you talking I, about i didn't i didn't need to see that um but like i said earlier sure. he's, he's a little he's a little too whiny for me so you um so you're, I mean, so if you're I were, not a fan of uh, of Kylo? No. Oh, interesting. No, not really. I, I'm not buying it. I mean, I know he has daddy issues and whatnot, but sure. I, I'm not real. I'm not really buying it. So what is it you're not buying? Just, just the whininess. Okay. I I, I don't know. I, so Darth Vader didn't whine that much. Yeah. Well, well wait, Vader did. Well, he did. He did <laughs> before in the middle he ones. got his okay. little jumpsuit. Uh, he, I think he was even worse, but he, he kind of went through those things. So I, I can understand that point of view where okay. you, you kind of want him to be more Sith, which he's yes. not, he is torn in the middle. And I think that essentially you're seeing somebody who's kind of psychopath that is trying to figure out where do I fit in all this? Um, he wants, I can appreciate that. He wants the power. He wants to be the bad guy yet at the same time, there's good in him. And so every, every Jedi struggles with, you know, the force and the dark side and finding that balance. And I think it makes him a little more vulnerable. It does. And that is why he's overcompensating it. it, Also, this is somebody who I believe is, it's not really revealed, but he's supposed to be still a older teenager or somebody that's not much older than Ray. Uh, that he's, he just sounded like if I close my eyes, you sound like Napoleon Dynamite sometimes. Yeah, a little bit. You, you can see that a little but, bit. A little God, bit. Get your own talks. Or, or, or Kip. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Napoleon. Uh, uh, so after they start kind of, you know, space Skyping with each other, the whole shirt scene, yes, that's obviously was kind of, I don't know if we've seen nipples in Star Wars, but. That was probably a first. Well, other than the ones that Luke was working earlier, but the space the, uh, nipples or alien nipples, but <laughs> yeah, the 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 reasoning behind that, according to the director, was that that was a way for them to establish that they could actually visualize or see each other, uh, and that's why she kind of said like, "Oh, put your shirt on," because up yeah. until that point, you didn't really know if it was just them talking to each other in their head or if there was an actual visual. I'm in your environment. I can see what's going on, kind of thing. Uh, okay. Which is a is, is a good way to kind of do that. I'm sure there could have been many it's other. Good re- adi- it's just good etiquette. You, know, you don't Skype someone with your shirt off. It's just not. Well, it, it all yeah, it's but, bad form. But it also felt like they couldn't actually control it because there are points where where Ray was like, "Oh, not this again," and I don't have time for this. Or she was trying to dismiss that because his presence showed up. So it seemed like something that they couldn't quite control or wasn't convenient when they wanted it to. But, uh, but I like how they didn't really like run that part into the ground either. It didn't happen that much. Yeah. There was a few sequences. Uh, if it happened one more time, I would have been annoyed. I think it happened just the right amount of time where they kind of did that Skype thing. And the best part of it was when Luke busts in the room uh, and sees like it going that. on. And then that's kind of the, I think the first time you really see him show any that's kind of power. Or, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Just that's swooped in. was like, did. Nope. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. like your, your, that's like your mom catching you doing something you're not supposed to be doing back in the day, you know? <laughs> yeah. That was a great scene. I thought that was Thanks, pretty Luke. funny. Thanks Luke. You know, you might be on this Island all alone, but I got needs. Uh, yeah, I got to get mine. I got to get mine, Luke. So the, now this is where the movie kind of takes what I would say is the only turn that I really wasn't pleased with is Haldo takes over and now comes up this plot to where, you know, Finn meets Rose and they're going to go to this casino in Canto Bight and they're going to track down this pirate who's going to be able to get him on the ship and do all these kinds of things. He can hack the, the what, whole weapon uh, what system. What didn't you like about it? Well, 
it was a very long a very long sequence of events that really didn't contribute significantly to the overall story. I just didn't really care. I'm not a huge fan of Finn and his character. I wasn't really on board with Rose either. I just kind of felt it was yeah. a little bit of a momentum killer and it didn't really contribute much because like many other aspects, this is a movie that is essentially a movie of failure. Everybody fails in this movie and totally. that's the theme uh, of the last Jedi. And so it's nice to see them go through there and not succeed the way that they thought. Uh, but the whole, I, it just had a different vibe to it. Very prequely, in my opinion, the look, yeah, the casino, the, feel, the casino was going for the, what the music they're going for, the old cantina music. It was, yeah, it felt like the prequels a little twist it on it. Felt a lot like George yeah. Lucas's influence was very strong in that area, but, but to their right chimed in and say, "Hey, can you include the yeah. casino?" I, I was it thinking might be about for the kids putting in a casino scene with a racing of these alien horses. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, Mr. Lucas, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I, I think when they talk to him, they don't look him in the eye. They just <laughs> you just look, bow to him. Yes. Oh, yes. We'll, we're yes, working on that scene right now, sir. Yeah. yeah. Bringing him little trays of hot towels as he dabs his face. Uh, and then he walks away. They're like, that guy's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's who a Who is that guy again? Yeah. Who was he? Who's that old doddering man? Yeah. What's with the, uh, with the, the flannel the, shirt? That strange in. neck beard thing he's got going. Anyways. So. Tuck, tucked in flannel shirt. I, I wasn't feeling the casino. Uh, I thought it was well done. It was clever how they set it up. It made sense for the Star Wars universe. And I'm okay that it had a little bit of the prequel vibe because that is still part of this story. That is, even though it might not visually be what they want, it did feel part of this universe. Uh, a little hokey. But it was just hokey, and it didn't really lead to anything other than just a bunch of different scenarios and, and sequences that were felt like just kind of filling some time. I almost kind of felt like, Ryan Johnson didn't really know what to do with Finn, didn't know where to put them, came up with this sequence. And, and if they had cut this sequence, it would have not been the longest Star Wars out of the franchise. It, it, yeah, it, it wouldn't it have been. It is the longest. It is, but yeah. but they could have yeah. they could have still accomplished what they wanted to, but kept something a little bit more uh consistent. So different plot device. When they meet was it DJ uh, uh Benicio del Toro? Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people were disappointed by him. I, I thought he was cool. I, I enjoyed his character. Uh, he's not in it long. He didn't need this huge part, but he had some really good lines. And I think the the most successful thing that came out of that whole casino sequence is when they're on the ship, and they find out that the good guys and the bad guys are dealing to all these other people, and it's really just kind of a you know arms dealing. It's all a matter of perspective, and that was a little social commentary. A little social commentary, which again was nice at how they put that in without giving us a fifteen-minute speech on the intergalactic Senate floor. Uh, but it worked for me. It wasn't heavy-handed. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. And me too. So after you kind of go through that sequence, we finally get to where Luke is wanting to to train Ray, uh, and which I was pretty excited about. To kind of get to see, I'm thinking, oh, we're gonna see Luke training Ray as similar we saw Yoda and Luke. I didn't expect, you know, Luke to be given you know, Ray a piggyback ride around the island, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was, and that was one of the scenes that they cut was this third lesson that supposedly piggyback? she received. No, not the piggyback. There's more to that that they cut. They said it just didn't really work. For what the film was, but I, I I felt there was some missed I opportunities. I would have taken that in lieu of the casino. Yeah, I would have too. You could have cut out the dumb horse yeah. thing and the race thing and yeah. put that in. Uh, you know, but the casino. Going back to that really quick, it did also kind of establish the greater universe of of unfortunate kids and how the poor were being treated. And I think that that's going to come into play in the next movie. Uh, okay, um, especially with how they ended the movie. But we'll get back to that in a minute. All right. So now we're past this whole casino thing. The excava uh, excavation plan, the evacuation plan begins. Holdo's got this whole strategy where everybody gets out and I'm going to distract him. Uh, and it leads to that pretty kick-ass scene where she takes the the Star Destroyer and light speeds it right through the, the First Order ships. Uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I thought that was rad. It's probably one of the coolest moments in all of the Star Wars movies just because it was such a departure for how they've done things before. So kamikaze. It was. It, it should have been Akbar if the, anybody was going to do it. I wasn't a big fan yeah. of Holdo's character. Or uh, Greedo. Yeah, uh, no, Greedo. 
He's he's <laughs> yeah. I said he shows Bye, up. Greedo. I got this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. Remember me? <laughs> yeah. No, that would have been weird. But uh, yeah. and now we're kind of getting through where Ray is, you know, confronting Luke over what you know Kylo basically told him about why they broke up because. As as Ray and Kylo are kind of you know space timing with each other, she gets the download on what happened. Luke is not who you think he is. He tried to kill me, you know the whole the whole backstory. Asshole. Whole backstory is Luke knew he was teaching a baby Hitler and had second thoughts, thought about killing <laughs> him. So Kylo wakes up, freaks out that it was that he saw what he saw, and defends himself and somehow destroys Luke's whole training camp. That he has, but it's 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 kind of like who do you believe though? Because I mean, Luke's a jerk, and he has his story. And then Kylo's, like you said, a psychopath, and he has his story. So it's that's never really resolved. I mean, it, they could both be totally made up. Yeah, there's two ways I look at it. It I I like how they did it because there was two versions of the same situation. So it's going to be ambiguous no matter what. There's a matter of perspective here, but ultimately, the thing that doesn't quite stick for me is regardless of the situation to where, you know, you have Leah, uh, uh, Organa, sorry, and, and Han's kid, you're getting trained by your uncle, and somewhere out of the blue, you think your uncle's going to kill you. So you're like, that's it, I'm going bad. So yeah. I, I just, they didn't quite really establish, like, how did that push him as far as he went? Why, Sounds like someone needs their own spinoff movie. Yeah, that would be, yeah, we'll never know. But yeah, I, and I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to resolve him at some point in time, but he's a really bad person. He's done a lot of bad things. I just, it's hard for me to visualize that that one moment is where everything went bad and started spiraling down. He had to have had something torn with him. And they did mention some things about that in the movie about how Luke was picking up on his powers and how he was using those in his motivations and stuff. So there was a little bit of that equity built in, but overall I felt it was a very clean way to kind of communicate their separation and also, and, and they might get into something later in the next film too about it. They might, they might. That's also why Luke is where he's at because he, he failed that person and he probably has nothing but guilt. And that's why he kind of isolates himself. And it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It works. Uh, so eventually Ray gets what she wants, leaves the island. Luke goes to the tree to have a couple tears, and then a rubber puppet comes and visits him. Ah. Yeah, Yoda. Was that a surprise for you? Yoda. I, I like Yoda. He's my favorite Star Wars character. Yeah. So it was nice to see Yoda. Yeah, it was nice to see him as, uh, as a puppet. Yeah, and you know what? I actually didn't pick up on that he was a puppet. I, I thought it was like, yeah, it's pretty good CGI. But then afterwards reading out, I found out, they, yes, it's a rubber puppet. that had a little bit of a yeah. treatment to it, uh, yeah. which was a nice nod. I, I think that it maybe should have looked a little bit more puppety. They probably had to dust him off. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, come on. He was sitting up in Frank Oz's attic for like 15 years. All right, Yoda, come on, buddy. Yeah, Yoda does say after he kind of destroys the 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 tree the greatest teacher failure is and and you get that whole that theme that this is a movie of failure and, and it Learning really from hits mistakes it there. And, yeah so and I, I like it. I've always liked his wisdom so we almost we're almost through the whole thing where the Finn and Rose saga is coming to the end because they finally make it to the first order ship but they're taken prisoner and at the same time, Kylo brings uh, Ray to Snow because Ray goes there thinking, whatever, I can flip this guy. And so it goes to, she gets taken and she goes to Snoke. And that was probably the coolest sequence in all of Star Wars, period. You think so? I think so. That whole, well, I mean, first of all. We'll talk about Snoke for a minute. Who Who's playing Snoke? So Andy Serkis is playing Plain Snoke, and you—you you guys should know how much we love that guy. He does—he's awesome in everything he does, and I thought he did great. I thought Snoke looked pretty kick-ass. Yeah, uh, I wasn't really concerned about the lack of his backstory. I don't really think it matters. Never heard of him. It doesn't now. matter. Yeah, it, it's not really necessary for this story. Even with his death and not getting that, I mean, this people are expecting. I think a little bit too much. I mean, the first time you saw Vader, did you get his backstory? 
No. You know, so let, let's not get out of control. Is that this is a, con- a consistent thing throughout Star Wars? I was okay with it. I thought he was a great kill- character. I did think they may have killed him quickly or early. I did expect him to die. Uh, yeah. Just not this soon in the movie because I was enjoying the scenes that he was in. But ultimately, in the way he was killed too. I mean, that was just kind of oh okay. Yeah, that's it. That's all it takes. I think it was. I think it was clever, but it kind of showed his his arrogance and how his young uh, uh, disciple was able to pull one off on him. But I do believe that this the whole sequence of events that happens in Snoke's throne room is probably the coolest overall scene setting fight sequence in all the Star Wars movies. You really can you really think of something I, better? I was impressed. I, you know what? Not really. I mean, I was. I mean, you could always go back to Jedi and say that that final scene uh, where they're fighting in front of the Emperor, Darth Vader, and Luke Skywalker, that's pretty cool, but they're always cutting back and forth. But it seemed like this scene, it was it was just kind of a one continuous scene that unfolded, and I really, I really liked it. It was really cool. I thought it was shot really well, had had a lot of yes. those elements of old samurai flicks. And, it did. And had some purpose to it. And it was interesting to see the, where you kind of going like, maybe this is where... Is Ray and and Kylo are they joining forces? Is this what the whole plan was? I think a little bit from. Do you think there's a love interest? Like, do you think she's attracted to him? Do you think he's attracted to her? What's the motivation? Here? I I honestly don't think so. Uh, and I think that it's interesting you ask that because there is an absence. Well, Luke kind of messed it up. Well, <laughs> thanks, Luke. Thanks, Luke. There is an absence of Salter. romance in these ones where all the other other trilogies. The other two pairs had uh, had romance going on. This this yeah. one has yet to do that, except for the end when uh, Finn and Rose have their little spark. But Aww. I know, like oh. But aside aside from that, I, so I don't cute. think so. I think that there's a connection because they're both very uh, uh, amateur with their powers, and they could imp- commonality. They could flip, good or bad, and I I think that. They don't really know all those. They don't know all the aspects of what they can or can't do. Ray is still learning that. She's still very young. Obviously, Kylo is a little bit more focused and powerful. But what you will notice, and this is what I, I kind of appreciate about his character, and hopefully, uh, you know, others will feel the same way, is that his style of fighting and everything with him is very raw. And you'll notice this: the way that his yeah. stance is, the way he holds his sword, is much more like a knight of the round table rather than a samurai. And okay. the way that he carries himself, the way that he lunges and attacks, his stances is very, very raw, like a like a broadsword fighter. It's not a finesse oriented. So, and he seems to be kind of like an outcast. Absolutely, he is you know, a little I mean, bit when, of a one off when he's when he's coming in in the beginning. And uh, what's his name? Gleason comes out, and they just kind of give this look to each other. It's almost like he might be ridiculed, but nonetheless, he's a very powerful person. I think people are threatened by him, but like you mentioned yes. where he is a little bit of a whiny or he's a diva, that's kind of established in the first one because he wants to go and get this uh, lightsaber. He wants to find Luke Skywalker, and that's where Hux is kind of like, we're not here for your hobbies or your, your passions or whatever. We have a job to do. Um, yeah, and I like that conflict between them too. Yeah, the, the one, one guy's focused on the mission, wants to impress, and the other guy's got his own agenda. So ultimately, after that whole sequence, you know, BB-8 is helping Finn and Ray escape. Finn kills Phasma, which is the Chrome Giant. Uh, Good. Yeah. What'd you think? Yeah, I like that part. I like BB-8 too. Yeah, it's a, a good replacement for the other two, which they're they're those old uh, rust buckets. Yeah, they're a charm with each other. Got a little long in the tooth after the uh, prequels. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that scene. I, I think Finn got his justice. And well, well, well deserved. Do you feel they killed Phasma off too soon? No, I mean, time for her to go. Bye bye. I didn't have an issue with it. A lot of people yeah, were unhappy care. that, again, a lot of the people that are complaining, I, I've read, is they're unhappy that she was killed off so soon. Well, these people need to get jobs. <laughs> yeah, well. Stop complaining, finding fault with every little thing in the Star Wars universe. It's, we don't have time for that. I, I don't think every character that gets some kind of screen time or has some unique characteristic about them really needs to have this whole story and resolution yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, people are getting 
riled up about Phasma, but I'm not hearing anybody get riled up about Akbar. Yeah, well, that's back to the Akbar. Okay. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about old Fishy Head. Yeah, but well, Mr. Frog. Well, think about how much time Boba Fett had. Same kind of same kind of character, but a lot of people grabbed onto him after a while because he looked cool. And I think that you get a little bit of that similar type of feeling. I'm fine with Orlando. it. Orlando, yeah, Orlando, yeah. I'm I'm fine where with it. Where was he? By, where was he yeah, at? By where's the way? Lando at? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I need Lando. I, I think Lando's a bit too chubby to reprise his role. Uh, so Billy I, D. Yeah, I saw him on the uh, like, Star Wars celebration. Too many Colt one too many Colt forty five. <laughs> damn endorsement. I think he'll show up in the next one. I think at some point okay. they're gonna. I, they've got to bring him back in some capacity, but hopefully they make uh, be like make him lose Billy some D, weight. You need to do some bow flex and get back on the get treadmill, it, buddy. Get it going. Otherwise, you're not going to be in Star Wars anymore. You got nothing else going on. And now we're moving to the final sequence of the film, where once everybody gets off the ship, and now the the last dozen or so folks from the Resistance are at the stronghold. And do you think it was getting a little long at this point? Uh, or do you think, I mean, the length, do you think it's just right? It's or, hard or to tell because just... I totally had to take a rage and piss by this time in the movie. So you're kind of like, let's uh, go. But, uh, yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> I should have paid attention to how long it was. and should have monitored the, the large soda, but no, um, I mean, at this point it was kind of like, wrap it up. Let's, let's come on. It, what, I guess that's a good question. Cause for my feeling at this point in time, there, that the timing in which the throne room fight came on, was right around the time where most other Star Wars movies have resolved. So, okay. so that was where the climactic scene normally was. And then it slows down again where you kind of get to the stronghold. So I do think that the movie struggled a little bit with that kind of pace. It has a different pace to it. So Which is okay. They, they could have, and I guess that's where seeing it a second time is one of the things that, that gets fixed. Is you're like, we're this far into it. Luke has had... Not that much screen time. He hasn't done any Luke stuff that I thought he would do by this point in time. I think I just saw the biggest fight of the movie. Now what? Yeah. And so that's where I, I, I kind of was going, all right, where, where is this going? And that's when I really started kind of getting a little concerned. You're like, why is it called The Last Jedi? Or, yeah. And then going, well, I like, don't mind long movies. I don't have to go to the bathroom again. Yeah, I don't no, know. Which, I don't mind which long, long movies. going on. Uh, yeah. It, but so the, once they're at the stronghold and it's clear that, you know, which I thought was a beautiful setting, by the way, with the way they had the salt and the red that came up and everything was pretty clever. That was cool. I like that. Eventually, everybody's there. They want to just take him out. And Luke shows up, which was a, a big surprise to everybody. Ray's not here. Leia thinks she's doomed. Yeah, you know, Finn has this so, dumb little moment where he's going to go kill himself, but then somehow out of the blue, Rose comes out and stops him, and then they're like, no, don't do it. And I thought that was stupid. Uh, yeah. It was just a little too convenient. Again. Yeah. So why do you think Luke came back? So he comes up and confronts basically everybody, and then you kind of find out that he, it's really not Luke. It's just a projection of him. Ah. So I, I believe that because he looked different like when you saw him projected he looked a little younger he, he didn't look so scruffy so let's get a little a little bit of backstory on this whole this whole sequence is luke okay. is on an island and he can't get off the island and people can see that his x-wing was submerged in the water he's an old old dude on the island he's not getting off so if he would have showed up you can get the x-wing out of the water though yeah but was is that thing who knows how long that's been under there is it gonna work i don't know it did for yeah it did for dagobah but um ultimately he's kind of a prisoner on that island he isolated himself he threw it in the water specifically because i don't plan on going anywhere self-imposed next so if he would have just shown up like in hindsight you look at it and go that's pretty clever because if he would have just shown up then there would have been a lot of questions of like, okay, wait a second. You just co- How'd he get you here? just covered a whole bunch of stuff in a little bit of time. How did he get here? Um, how did he know what's going on? But you walk into it and you're like, ooh, he's here. And I was right on board. I wasn't even thinking about any of that stuff because your first impressions are like, yep, Luke's here. He comes strolling in the cool back cave. It. Yeah, I was cool. I was like, I didn't know Jedi's could do this. Yeah, there's a lot of those also, things. Also, <laughs> I didn't I mean, know they could do that. St- there's like a lot of stuff they were doing that, you know, I mean, Leia could have done something else and fly into the, into the 
airlock and just walk right out, you know, but she chose to do that. But I mean, sure. yeah, Luke did some things that were uh, quite unexpected. And I, and nice surprise. he's pushing the boundaries of what the force is. So when he kind of goes, which is g- fine. Cause no one really knows what it is anyway. That's true. That's true. It's uh, how critical so you, you can, can we play get? with that concept all you want. Yeah. And I like that they were exploring that. I like that they were pushing those boundaries because I think it actually will save Star Wars in a lot of respects because it doesn't pigeonhole into this. This is what the past is. This is gospel. And I'll, I, I'll admit I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan where I consume them outside of the movies. Um, I'm almost strictly movies, some of the animated series, video games. Uh, that's where I've gotten most of my Star Wars from. So I don't have no a toys. You know, well, the toys of a given, but I don't have most of the. Uh, no, sold them all, made money. Um, uh, how dare yeah, you? Yeah, I know. In hindsight, I was like, probably should have waited ten more years. I mean, I didn't know that. <laughs> Maybe I should have sold that Admiral Akbar for something. Yeah, I stole that from under your pillow. Um, so and, uh, how di- that's where it went. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so after Luke does that. Yes, there are some clues. He wasn't leaving footprints in the salt. He had the wrong color lightsaber because that had already been been destroyed. Or he looked you know, like a little, he looked a little cleaned up. Like he was said. cleaned up. That looked like how I mean, he did in the flashback. He looked like a hippie going for a job interview, whereas on the island he looked yeah, like, like a hippie. Oh, this kinda. boy cleans up good. He cleans up really. Put a little dye in his beard. Yeah, not bad. Just for men. <laughs> Look at you, Luke. He looked all right. <laughs> and um, so, really, what is going on? according to Ryan Johnson and some other folks of speculation is that Luke went in the, in the form that would have antagonized Kylo the most or connected him with the most look the way that Kylo remembers him and old school, Luke. old school Luke and show that he can't be defeated while distracting and serving his purpose for everybody else to escape. So that's what his goal was. And he was just kind of taunting him. And I liked how he had the humor where he's dusting his shoulders off and he does a little matrix move and even drop matrix move was cool. And I'm waiting for him to attack, but he did. And I was like, Oh wait a what? And so that was a pretty cool reveal that Nope, he's astral projecting himself here. And that's not really him. Uh, even leaves with the, uh, see you around kid, which is the total Han Solo nod, uh-huh. which leads me to believe that Luke's going to be back. And and everybody's free and well, they get a hologram. Off. Yeah, as as the as the little ghost Luke, or a puppet. <laughs> that would be <laughs> that'd be weird. Yeah, yeah, like a an order for a Luke puppet, please. Uh, <laughs> life size, life size Luke puppet. Yeah, no, and everybody gets out. They get on the the Falcon. Everybody's safe. Luke is sitting there after he's well, back. His back up a minute. Back up. They were in. They were in the cave. How did they get out of the cave? They went through the back because they followed the little thing where the the crystal foxes were going. Yeah. And there's like a draft or whatever, and the foxes were getting out, and then that's where Ray shows up and you know does her Moses thing and pulls the rocks up. And and, uh, and I I liked it on the second time I watched it, the rocks came out and everyone was just kind of standing there, and I'm like, hurry up! She's yeah. holding up all these rocks. Yeah. They're like, oh, like, this is cool. Stand there. Oh, wow. No. <laughs> Move your ass. Like like the other guys are the, the guys are coming through the cave. They'll be there any minute. She's standing here holding all these rocks up. Get going. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, I would have I would have stood there and looked and been like, is it safe? Is it safe? And then I would have ran with that weird little like duck yeah. in my head, Three like seconds, I'm running in, like you're, in rain with like you're crossing like you're crossing the street. Yeah, look this way, look that way. And outside. You just, you book, get out of the falcon and go. Yeah. It could have been a little more hustle in their step there, but anyways. Oh. A little bit. A little bit. I know they had a long day, but let's, let's come on. So they're all in the Falcon. You see Luke doing his little floating bit, lays down, sees the twin sunset, and he pulls an Obi-Wan and vanishes and becomes one with the Force. Ah. So Luke is dead. Oh. Is he? Yeah, he's dead. Okay. He's dead. That's the same thing Obi-Wan did. Um... That's probably why Mark Hamill's mad because he's like, I don't get to do another one. Yeah, I mean, he's lived with the character Luke Skywalker for so long. In his mind, he had all these other things. So I think that they're going to bring him back very much like they've had Yoda, and he's going to play a role. Uh, Okay. And the movie ends in an interesting scene on Kento Bite with some little broom boy calling the broom to him using the Force. (laughs) 
So we've talked we've talked a lot about a lot of different details in here, but let's really let's dive into a couple more specifics. Uh, okay. Uh, so overall, you enjoyed the humor of this movie. You didn't feel that it was off putting or out of character for a Star Wars flick. No, I mean because if you go back and look at the old Star Wars before the like a train wreck ones, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Uh, the humor. W- you know, the humor was, it was good, especially with Harrison Ford. Well, that's the difference, though, is that... Yeah, so, I mean, they kind of had to make up for that and add some other humor, but I never felt it was, like, cheesy or forced. I think... Except for the melt the melt coming from the... Sure. The I like space the... Space tit. I mean, I didn't care for that, but... I like the scenario-based humor. I think that the other humor, especially with somebody like Han, is it's very character-driven. Sure. And while Poe is a smart ass, I don't necessarily see him as a humorous character or a very clever one that way because he has so many serious lines or he's running in his in his onesie from one he's, place to the next. Kinda, he's kind of juvenile. A little bit. It, it, and there's, you know, Hux was kind of the punching bag so far where <laughs> nobody really takes him seriously. And he was the Donnie. Yeah. And so I, I just kind of felt that what's lacking is is that comedic relief character or somebody that has that clever type of humor. There really isn't even, Finn has got a little bit of that in his character, in the way that he does certain things, which I think is funny. Uh, it's not an intentional yeah. joke. And this one, it did push the, the envelope a little bit more for what is a Star Wars joke. I'm okay with it. Uh, didn't really bother me too much. And, I mean, let's face it, this is this is Ryan Johnson's It's not a film. comedy. Yeah, it's not a comedy. Yeah. So... So you're not going to get, like, like if you want to get a comedy in this vein, go see Spaceballs. Yeah, go see Spaceballs. What did you What did you think of the length of the movie? Did you feel it was okay or was it a little too long? Um, I was, I kind of wanted a bathroom break there, like you were saying. Yeah. But I really had to exercise some of that, that self-will. I, I was using the force not to get up and go to the bathroom, I guess. Sure, sure. I mean... I like. I, w- I wish I could have. I wish I could have astral projected myself like Luke did to the bathroom, and <laughs> take taking care of business, and kept watching the movie. And then you, you come I, back after your projection I, and realize that your physical my, body my never went anywhere. Not, and now you, yeah, my training is at a, at a very early stage, so I'm not there yet. Yeah, baby steps. Sure, I'll get there. And yeah, I, I felt it was just right. I, I for what they had to do, they could have trimmed down obviously that whole middle sequence with the uh, can't buy the casino that. i think that I, it's necessary for some of the things that they wanted to accomplish in the plot but ultimately it didn't need to be as long as it did uh yeah you know one thing that did strike me a little bit different on this one compared to some of the others was the the personality of a planet or location that they're on there's a lot that took place in space and in these other areas to where just the scenarios that folks were at i th- you know, I th- I feel like a lot more of this movie took place in outer space as opposed to on a planet. That's true because when you when you go to the planet, you have to really you got to introduce that whole alternate, and it's always kind of patterned after something. Sure. In, in this case, it was like Las Vegas, um, in, in the original New Hope Star Wars when they went they went to the cantina, it was kind of like a Morocco thing. So you really, but you really have to kind of set that all up and make it work. In New Hope, it worked. I think I liked the cantina environment. In this one, I didn't really. It was just more of a distraction. Yeah, a little, a little campy, and I was like, I don't. All right, get out. Just get in the casino. Keep going. Uh, spend a little too much time there, and it, it, it didn't. Even, nothing really came out of it. What What did you think of the porgs or those little uh, bird things? Um, porgs is that what they're called, right? The on the island. Yeah. The ones that Chewie was cooking? They look like puffins. <laughs> I know. What what did you think okay. of them? Yeah, they do look like puffins. I didn't, what do you mean, what did I think of them? Like, I was like, oh, it's a puffin, but it's not. It's like a space puffin. Yeah, it's a space puffin. Yeah, so the Porg... Why? Do you, you know something about those things, or no, what's going on? No, no, no. I, I just think that uh, it was an interesting new character that they added that was kind of adding some of the, the cuteness to the movie. Um, well, I read I read something about it. Was they filmed all that stuff on an island in Ireland? Uh huh. And I guess those birds actually were puffins. Yes, or s- some variation of a puffin, right? But then I guess the owners of the island, or I don't know if they're owners, but 
they wouldn't let them film the puffins, so they had to use CGI puffins. No, they they could film the puffins, but they couldn't mess with the puffins because it was kind of like a sanctuary for them. So they could like pick them up and like throw them off a cliff or something. <laughs> yeah, they had to they had to come Hope up with something best. to replace the puffins. So they came up with the porgs. I mean, they were cute, but I really wish Chewie like, yeah, would have eaten it though. At, that that would have been pretty bad. Yeah, at one point you got to have dinner. Yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, folks are loving them. Some some people say that that's the. Uh, Disney influence of how are we going to get some mer- right. merchandise out of this movie? Um, I, I, it, Orcs. it seemed to work for me. It didn't bother me. You just hear, you just see noise, noise on the internet about the little uh, puffins there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, what, what, what else came from this movie that you? What are some of the take positive takeaways and some of your uh, critiques that you have overall? Well, I made my critiques. Uh, I'm not really. Sold on the whole Kylo Ren thing. Oh, gotcha. And being whiny. So, per- so I, I've already talked about that. Yeah. Um, I'm disappointed that they didn't have a funeral for Admiral Akbar. You wanted a better like death. A prop- I, I wanted a, like a proper, you know, naval style uh, <laughs> funeral for the some guy. Vi- really- some Viking funeral for Akbar. Yeah, you know, just kind of whatever. Do something for the guy. Yeah, it would have been nice well, yeah. to at least give him a. He's like, he's like, he's like the Sulu of that ship. You got to give him something. At least an on-camera death, as opposed to an yeah. off-camera implied death. Implied. Oh yeah, he's gone now. We're not gonna see him again. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else you got? You know, I mean, I mean, those are just kind of piddling little things, but overall, I really enjoyed the movie. I can't wait to see the next one. Mm-hmm. I, I think it carries the mantle of Star Wars very well. Mm-hmm. I like seeing Mark Hamill again. I, I thought he was doing porn or something. I didn't know where that guy's been. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't have to do a whole lot. He's been active. He stays out there, and I, I appreciate that. Doing what? Well, aside from a lot of the voice acting that he's been, been doing, I think, for the big core of his career, he's not really behind the camera. Uh, okay. He's also not getting cast in a lot of those things. I don't think he's really pursuing it. Uh, it, was just, it was good to see him again. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, you know, the Star Wars movies are a big part of my youth. I think Empire was one of the first movies I actually remember seeing in the theater. Mm-hmm. Maybe aside from uh, Indiana Jones, which we'll talk about at another time. So it's really kind of a part of, of growing up, part of American mythology. That's that's really what our generation has. And now it's interesting to see how they're handing that torch off to the next generation. And I think it's working pretty well. Um, just a couple things. It doesn't have to be perfect, but mm-hmm. I, I'm liking it. I'm fine with it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, to, to respond to, a f- I think they should have they should have gone with the with the working title for the film, which was Space Bear. Space Bear. Yes, that's pretty rad. Yeah, it's basically a kick-ass Ewok. Yeah, pretty much. You know, my favorite character, I would say, is Kylo. And I really thought Adam Driver knocked it out of the park in this movie. And I think he did a good job. I respect him as an actor. Yeah, he did. He did really well. And I and I liked the just the facial expressions and the way that he kind of carried that. Is you could feel him just being torn. There is a little he's bit tough. of that. Um, and he's probably the most developed character. I would say that this trilogy is going to be a little bit more about him than it would be about Ray. Well, if I had to give one good thing about him. You'd say a lot of characters in the Star Wars universe are kind of one-dimensional, and you don't really get too too heavy into their psychology, and that's completely the opposite with it, that guy. Yeah, it, it brings you back to he, some I of guess, the prequels where Anakin was trying to show this, I'm torn and I'm having issues, but I mean, Hayden Christensen was not the best at, at convincing audiences that that was an actual struggle. He was terrible. Yeah, terrible. Where's he at now? Uh, who knows? Work at a car wash or something. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, so some of the concerns I have that I kind of mentioned as we went along, and there's nothing really major. I'm not a big Star Wars nor- nerd. That I'm gonna pick away all these little things and go, oh, they didn't do this right, or I don't like that sequence, or I don't. I'm not that type of fan. My my complaints are a little bit, you know, you know love or hate Lucas his involvement in the first six movies created a certain level of continuity. And 
now we've seen two movies back to back that don't have a single unifying person that is connecting them together, which yeah. allows somebody like Ryan Johnson to make his own film. It allows him to take things that the previous director maybe teed up and go, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I got my own vision. I think that's important. I think it's great that, I mean, I'm not familiar with anything he's done prior to this, but I think that's a, a pretty brave stand to make. It is. Especially it, when you're, especially when you're dealing with something like star Wars. I mean, if he did this with some other franchise, it would have been a different story. It It is. And he, and he has that faith from the brain trust at, at Disney. Uh, my concern really though, is, is that you could get a little bit too much of a disconnect depending on what JJ does is really going to make this trilogy come together. Gel gel well, or is it going to feel a little bit too disconnected? Cause you go from the force awakens, which has, I thought it was very well made, very good tempo. It's a very efficient film. There's very little wasted space and it's set very, and it's got a nice rhythm to it. And then you go to this one, which is a much longer uh, movie and there, there are some low spots. There are definitely some really, really high spots, which are some of the best different, period. Different tone. Completely. It's such a stronger correction in the other direction. Depending on how they come back, I think, in the next one's really going to determine where this sits al- amongst all the Star Wars movies. So would you kind of compare this where Force Awakens was a lot like New Hope? This could be a lot more like Empire? Uh, yes. If you but, had to draw but, a comparison, old versus new? Or do you think this one might be a little more like a Return of the Jedi? I think it's it's a it's a if we're talking tone sure, and feeling. Sure. It's that's a tough question to answer, I think, because what those movies have are not really present here. The the original 3 do have a lot more of the mythology in them. There's n- True. and a reason why that works is cuz you don't know a whole lot. You don't really know about the Force, so you, you're you're allowed to use your imagination. You're not getting all this backstory. You're not getting all these things. You take it at face value. And, and that's why it works, because yes. he, he leaves it up to... And that's why a lot of movies work great, because they don't have to tell you every single thing and explain every single thing. They just allow you to make this up in your mind and make it part of Absolutely. what you are or what you believe. But the Star Wars universe has expanded significantly since then to where now everybody knows everything about everybody. There's not a whole lot of mystery. And I liked... Except for Lando. Well, except, except for Lando. But I liked seeing a Star Wars movie where you, you didn't get all those answers. You didn't get... Like, who gives a damn about Snoke and his, his upbringing or where he's from or where he's going? Who cares that Phasma didn't live that long? Like, it's exactly what yeah, the originals like, were like. I, I saw... I saw Snoke. I'm like, who's this little shriveled up old dude? Yeah, and and when you saw him as a hologram in the first one, you see him on camera here. He didn't last that long, and and he served his purpose. Move on. Sure. Uh, I I liked it, and the, but that I do have some concerns on the the continuity, and you could get JJ could have issues with the way that Ryan Johnson took this script, and maybe who gives a shit? But it, it's going to show up in the next movie when he directs it. And All right. so, so what you might end up having is a little bit of a disconnected thing where it doesn't feel like a trilogy in the same way that the Lord of the Rings do or the Indiana Jones trilogy does or the original ones. It might it's lack kind some of a that. handoff. It, it yeah, might so feel that way. It might lack some of that cohesion. Yes, it, it already does because they look visually very different. True. But I also think that that a big element of that is necessary to push the boundaries of what Star Wars should and could be. And I think that's what we absolutely got. So hats off to Ryan Johnson uh, for getting that done. I, I will say that I really respect his uh, his presence online and how he's been responding to a lot of the criticism. Uh, he, uh-huh. he has definitely been all over it, whereas you don't get that with JJ. You didn't get that with Lucas. He's encouraging. They're, too, they're busy, though. Yeah, he's encouraging these discussions. Well, he's going to be really busy because he's going to be taking on a whole new trilogy in the Star Wars universe on his own. Sure. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where he's going to take it. Um, so What's Lucas up to, though? Just enjoying his money? He Have you ever seen Scrooge McDuck? <laughs> Pretty much he's doing that. <laughs> yeah, huh? That's what I imagine Lucas is doing. He's just, he's just buying like stuff he doesn't need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like a gold-plated umbrella stand or something silly. Just yeah. Well, when they asked him, I think he said it was beautifully made. He probably has a closet with like five hundred flannel shirts. I, I'm sure, and like five pairs of jeans. <laughs> I can never catch a break. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, George. So- sorry. 
so where do you think they're going to take it? What are you expecting in the next movie? Well, I, I want to see them obviously delve a little more into that relationship between Ray and, and Kylo Ren. I think that would be interesting. Okay. I don't think they're going to get back into Luke. I, I don't really see how that's going to happen. You know they're going to get more into Finn and his little misadventures. So I, I really want to see it go a little darker. But with J.J., you don't know. Or with J.J. too, it could just get weird to go the direction of Lost or something. Yeah, it could. It could. So, but I'm not. What is that? I, I mean, I what does a darker went, script to you look like? What do you see happening to these characters? I want to see uh, something happen to Kylo Ren. You think he's gonna think he's gonna kick the bucket? Yeah, that, that sure. All right. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I just, I'm not really going into it with a lot of expectations. I'd like to see something a little more akin to Empire, where it was just this kind of dark. And that's why I liked the movie so much. It was just it was very dark. Um, a lot of things happened in it that set up a tone for later. With with the next Star Wars coming along, I mean, I want to see that relationship get a little bit, a little bit heavier. Mm -hmm. But I can I can easily see a scenario happening where Ray like might get tempted by the dark side. Yeah, that's um, that's that possible. Could, that, could, that could happen too. I mean, it, it happened for kind of a minute there in Return of the Jedi. So I could see them kind of harkening back to that and making her flirt with that dark side a little bit. But with her, you don't know either. Do you, do you think that it's possible for Kylo to redeem himself? Uh, I think so. I think so. Right now the ball's kind of is in, in his court. But so this is a guy who's whatever. killed lots of people, blown up planets, you name it. Yeah, but I, I'm all about second chances, man. <laughs> You're very generous. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I think he needs to do some serious like community service. Put in some time, you know, like pick up some space poop or something, and sure, you know, sure. take care I'm of. Sure uh, the, maybe the, go clean the up. The puffins are making plenty. He might have to go clean up Dagobah or something, but uh, I, I, I think he can. Re I, I think he can redeem himself. But for now, he's just that kind of token. You need that in the Star Wars universe. You need that bad guy. I, I, he's the one. I don't think he's going to turn around. If he does, it's going to be for a minute, and then he's going to get killed or something. Yeah, there's a, there's many ways that they can take it. Uh, my guess is going to tell me um, is they have to resolve Carrie Fisher, Leia. Not you know she's dying. So uh, I think that they're probably going to do a time warp where the next movie is going to be six months to maybe a couple years after this one, uh -huh. and they'll probably either address her absence some way or another in the opening crawl of that movie i think that because they did the little teaser with the broom boy at the end uh on cantobite where you see the kid using the force because one of the things we didn't talk about was the reveal about ray's parents about being nobodies which is yes. another thing that a lot of people got hung up on because they want it to all be you have to be born into the force you have to have these powers and i like how he told her that like he just when Kylo Ren told her, yeah, her you're nothing. Were, he, just, he just, yeah, like you're just worthless. And and I mean, he just broke, he broke her off. But it is possible, it is possible, and this was confirmed w with Ryan Johnson that that may have just been another way for him to try to manipulate her into seeing things his way. Uh, yes. But at the same time, at the end of the movie, we see some other kid that we don't really believe is born into it using the Force. It changes what we thought the Force was and who could have that power influence. Uh, Luke, Correct. Luke, and this is the this is Luke's whole saga, the Skywalker saga. He was born into it. He has those powers, and now we're starting to get a departure from that, and that's a big different direction because it kind of says that anybody, in theory, could. Don't quite know what the qualifications are or what makes one person more inclined to have force tendencies than the other. How much training you'll need? Yeah, but that's new. That's a that's very new to this this universe. And I like that because it means it could just keep developing. It could, and they're not stuck. They're not stuck having to always make this a family thing, which I think is a, yeah. You can't pitch and hold. Yeah, it. which is great. So I, I would agree with you. I this movie definitely w was dark, but I don't think it was Empire dark. Um, yeah, I think that the stakes need to mean something in the in the next movie because although Luke died uh in this movie he didn't really do a whole lot other than you know provide a distraction 
And right. that might be what flips Kylo's character into a whole nother realm. And I think that he's going to start looking more and more Sith like. And Interesting. I think he's going to continue down that spiral and start physically looking evil in the next movie. And I, like and I think that he's really going to become a true villain to Ray. He'll look even more emo. Than yeah. He does yeah. Now. He looked even more emo, but he's going to look like a true he'll villain like, to her. He'll look like, he'll look like Robert Smith. from The cure. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, once, once he starts putting on uh some, some makeup and everything, he can totally, he can totally go that direction. Right. Uh, you know, you know, two things um, I, I would, I would like to see in the future Star Wars, um, one, a little, a little cameo maybe from Darth Nihilus. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'll talk to you more about him off uh, Mike because he is an actual character. And two, two, two more puppets. You want more puppets? I love the puppets. Yeah. I don't know why, but I do. I mean, I wouldn't mess with them because I think it's weird to play with puppets when you're a grown man. But, sure, sure. You know, puppets are great. Well, we've learned that you love Akbar and you love puppets. We need an Akbar yeah, puppet. But, Hey, you gonna you gonna make me one? No, I'm not. But I'll 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 probably All I'll right. probably source one from somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, I I hope that they resolve the story of some of these characters, but at the same time, leave it open enough to not necessarily continue this story, um, but just kind of wrap up where the galaxy is going. I mean, it's interesting. I I, I don't know. I don't really have big expectations. Do you think, it, do you think there will ever be a, an end to this thing? I think that they need to resolve the whole Skywalker saga. They need to retire all these original characters. I mean, I mean this franchise. Do you no, think there will ever be? No, okay, no. ever. Uh, not when not when you put a movie out and in four weeks it does one point two billion dollars. Like, yeah, it, not gonna. Yeah, end. you just need to treat it like Luke and just start milking it for all you can. So Disney's going to do that. You have to. And as long as people continue to go, then that's great. But they're going to have to continue to expand the Star Wars universe, and. If they, I like how they're going to do the spinoff movies. That's a yeah, great idea. And if they don't do it successfully, then I think they're going to reel it back. And that's why Darth Nihilus and Admiral Akbar need their own spinoffs. <laughs> Darth Nihilus. Yeah. And, and Greedo. Yeah, and I don't think any reason to pay to go see them. Maybe a Netflix series for those. Uh, I would. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, they've got the solo movie coming out, which everybody is really nervous about. We've talked about that. Uh Ewan McGregor is flirting with the ability uh, to possibly come back as Obi Wan in a, a prequel and of. He sorts. wanted to come back for this movie too. Yeah, would uh, he, well, he wouldn't have worked in this one. Um, no, he, I, I already wanted to. Yeah, he loves why, he but... loves playing the character. He had a great time doing it, and I would totally and welcome an well. Obi Wan flick. And there Hold there's on. discussion of a Boba Fett side movie um given some of these characters which i think is great but at the same time when you see something like rogue one and it's not really a lightsaber jedi focused movies but it's in that universe and it was good i, I would like to see it go maybe a little bit more in that direction i really liked uh, rogue one so i i liked how it great was really movie really violent the stakes were high which i said is what i'd love to see in the next one is you never everybody dies yeah you need to feel like it means something there's got to be a whole point behind it other than like i don't know what my place is in the universe it's like who cares you're just some person who has these little abilities now yeah get over yeah, yourself get over yourself and figure it out um but i'm optimistic for it i think jj is gonna do a good job and hopefully uh, I think that uh, what I kind of like is JJ's always played a little bit safe, but as you can kind of see with his Star Trek flicks, is that he started kind of departing from status quo a little bit. And I hope we get to see some some new things from him as a director uh, in the next Star Wars movie. Absolutely, awesome. All right, any final thoughts? You good? Yeah, I'm good. That was a good one. Star Wars: Last it was. Jedi. What's uh, what's coming up on a future episode? Well, next week, I think that we're going to dive into what I consider the best movie of all time, and that is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ooh. Indiana Jones. I know, we're keeping with some of the continuity here with the, the Han Solo Indiana Jones connection, but I definitely think that that is a movie that warrants to be in our top ten episodes. Uh, so we're going to spend some time on that, talking about the original trilogy, the good ones. I like it. And... 
If you uh, if you want to get involved in the discussion, if you have any questions, thoughts, or feelings, be sure to check us out over at Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook at The Harsh Review. If you had a good time and you enjoyed this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. We greatly appreciate it and want to get engaged and hear what movies you would like for us to talk about or maybe some questions for the upcoming flicks. Have you seen Indiana Jones? Do you like it? Do you have questions, thoughts, feelings? Let us know. Other than that... And make sure uh, make sure you subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. Outside of that, we really appreciate your time and we'll see you in the next episode. This is Sean. And this is Ryan. Right, have a good one. See you later.